Joining us now is Murtaza Hussein of The Intercept to talk all things Saudi Arabia. It's good to see you, man. Welcome to the show. And nice to see you guys. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen in terms of what's happening exactly with the U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, there's a horrific campaign going on right now in Yemen. The news just broke this morning, Murtaza, that the U.S. has supplied Patriot missiles to the uh, Saudis, despite the fact that we've extracted no promises from them in order to pump no oil. We just simply are doing it as a gesture of goodwill, which is please pay attention to us. As somebody who's been covering this for such a long time, what does this tell us about the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia? Well, it's, it's a very curious relationship because in many ways, Saudi Arabia is dependent on U.S. security guarantees. Uh, they're dependent on political guarantees from the U.S. They have very close ties with U.S. elites. But as we see, there is not a, the reciprocity you'd expect given the unequal relationship here as well, too. Uh, you may have seen in the past few days, there were stories about the crown prince of Saudi Arabia not returning the calls of the U.S. president. It's a very significant sort of signal. I think that uh, what you're seeing here is that there are many states in the Middle East, especially, that have had a lot of money or had a lot of political connections in D.C., and there's a sense of entitlement that's come along with that now, or a sense that uh, they're paying money and they expect good customer service from U.S. elites who they deal with no normally. Uh, you know, I'm not super, you know, we should not take everything symbolically so seriously, but I think that generally speaking, it's a significant step for a Saudi crown prince to literally ignore the the phone call of a U.S. president or refuse to speak to them. It's a bit of a slight against U.S. leadership and by extension, the American electorate who likes Donald Trump or Joe Biden, whoever else it is. It's significant that, you know, we don't really take a hard line with these countries. And the more and more we allow them to have a lot of runway in their behavior, the more you see these sort of abuses, whether they be, you know, slights against Americans or abuses like what we're seeing in Yemen, which the U.S. is actually supporting in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you talk more about that for people who haven't followed what's going on in Yemen closely? Um, what is our level of complicity in that crisis, which is considered to be the greatest humanitarian crisis on the planet right now? So the U.S. has given arms and the political support to Saudi Arabia and the coalition of other Arab states, which have been blockading Yemen, which has been at war with Yemen for several years now. It's actually interesting that uh, post you know, in the last decade or so, it's clear that the U.S. tried to build up Saudi Arabia as a local proxy in the sense that it could do expeditionary, uh, military expeditions on its behalf, uh, building up its military, its air force, training, and so forth, with the hope that, you know, the way that Iran was a long time ago before the revolution and the way Turkey has been and certain other states have been in the Middle East, they would be the enforcer of U.S. interests alongside the U.S. in the region. But I think we've seen that the war in Yemen is not ending. It's not uh, even clear that Saudi Arabia is winning it or the tide is turning or even that there's a stalemate. Things seem to be getting pressurely worse for Saudi Arabia and Yemen. After years and years, very lopsided conflict. The U.S. has been arming this conflict at the beginning. We're seeing that Saudi Arabia is not seemingly capable of acting as the role the U.S. The US wanted. And instead, we're in this sort of worst of all worlds situation where the war is going on and on. Uh, there's been shelling of... Uh, you know, that UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia as well, too, from Yemen rockets have been fired as well backwards. And it's not getting better, but it's not also coming to conclusion. And we settled to a status quo where this blockade is on Yemen, where millions of people are starving, uh, there's mass outbreaks of disease. And what you're seeing is the richest country in the Middle East really decimating the poorest country in the Middle East. It's a very ugly scene. And we certainly are have been complicit on the side of Saudi Arabia. Right. So from a moral perspective, obviously that's happening. And then from a geostrategic perspective, Murtaza, the way this is always justified is, yeah, but they pump all the soil. They have all this money. What are we supposed to do? We have to support them. This is about balancing against Iran, the Abraham Accords, and all of that. In terms of actual U.S. interests from a hard power perspective, we already outlined they're not doing what we asked them to do. But are they having a detrimental, out, you know, a detrimental impact on U.S. interests in the region? Well, if you look at the, the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia going back to 100 years, when Saudi Arabia didn't really even exist at that time, it was in the very nascent stages of uh, becoming a country. Uh, when the U.S. developed this relationship with them, there was expectation that, okay, we'll provide security and protection. And in return, when we need you to do so, you'll pump more oil. And this has been the – whatever else is said about, uh, you know, relationships between people or peoples or whatever else it is, that's like been the core crux of the relationship and what's led to the U.S. security guarantee for Saudi Arabia for so many years. Now we're seeing that they're not exactly willing to do that per se when we want to. They're kind of standing up and saying, well, 
we're not going to do that. We're going to ignore these requests. So we have other you know, potential partners. There was a very important story in the Atlantic a few days ago by um, Graham Wood. He was interviewed with the mm-hmm. MBA, Mohammed bin Salman. And he mentioned in the interview that, you know, if you don't like us, we have other options. We have China. They're glad to take our oil or our investment money and so forth. And I think that's true. And we're seeing some of that now, too, because, you know, they're entertaining calls with Z while ignoring Biden. There's reports of the Chinese helping them develop ballistic missiles. And they're pivoting in some ways or hedging their bets a little bit because they feel the U.S. not doing everything they want. From a hard power perspective, for the time being, Saudi oil is still very important to the global markets. And But I think mm-hmm. even they see that, you know, there's going to be a horizon somewhere where oil is going to be less, somewhat less crucial than it is uh, today. It will be decreased reliance on it, other alternative energy sources, nuclear, renewables, many, many other things. And when that time comes, Saudi Arabia will not be so indispensable to the U.S. as it is t- today. And it's becoming less so. There's been a natural gas and oil revolution in the U.S. There are other alternative sources coming on the market. It's still very important, but I think that it's possible for them to overestimate their importance. And if they continue Mm -hmm. overestimating it, and if they continue going down the same path vis-a-vis the U.S. as they are today, they're going to find that we don't have much in common and we have a lot of great differences. And the U.S. could become easily a rival or an antagonist to the U.S., uh, to Saudi in the Middle East. Uh, if the relationship is not built on something more solid than this very transactional bargain that they are no longer even holding up. Mm. You suggested a moment ago that perhaps the Biden administration to, should take what you described as a harder line with Saudi. I would say that them transferring uh, Patriot anti-missile interceptors to <laughs> Saudi is probably the opposite of a hard line. So what would an alternative approach look like? You know, it's very interesting because uh, they, uh, the Saudis, we do give the Saudis pretty much everything they want in many ways. Like this, uh, the contention on MBS's part or the Saudi leadership's part that the U.S. has somewhat pivoted away from Saudi Arabia, that's what they, they view it as. It doesn't seem very substantiated. The one thing that I could see is the Iran nuclear deal. Um, but either the U.S. has its own interest in pursuing the region to extricate itself in the region after many, many years of inconclusive and, uh, you know, many ways failed wars. So... You know, transferring these missile systems, I think that there's still a very complex relationship here. The U.S. does not want to completely alienate Saudi Arabia right now. They don't not able to do everything they want. The Iran deal is potentially being revived right now uh, within the next week or so. It's a lot of signs of that. And they're trying to assuage their anger by giving them these missile systems and trying to have it both ways. I think there's a very indecisive policy. Can we say that there's yes. a coddling policy or a hard line? There's an indecisive one. A hard line policy would be, you know, it would be something maybe closer to what we're seeing, not all the way in the spectrum, but closer to what we're seeing in Russia. It'd be sanctions on Saudi officials for human rights abuses, which we know is going on very, very, very extensively in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, still there was a killing of a Washington Post columnist by the Saudi Crown Prince. Mm-hmm. Not that long ago, they kind of escaped censure from that. They get a free pass for a lot of things. And this goes back even before that, the war on terror era. Uh, there are a lot of things that they get away with effectively because, and that's the indulgence that they get for being having this relationship. If we stop giving those indulgences, it would start feeling like a hard line, even though we're only enforcing our own interests. Murtaza, how much of this um, latest, you know, MBS not taking the phone call and uh, unwilling to pump more oil and all of that, How much of that is a sort of direct interference in our politics? It's part of what Ken Klippenstein has been reporting on over your colleague at The Intercept there, that effectively, look, they may be getting 95% of what they want out of the Biden administration, but they got 100% of what they wanted out of the Trump administration. They see Biden is weak politically with low approval ratings. They see he's likely to get shellacked in the midterms. And so they're happy to put their thumb on the scale to— try to affect that outcome, have Republicans take control of the House and the Senate, ultimately perhaps reinstall Trump in the White House. How much of it is them sort of not only just waiting out the Biden term, but actively trying to make sure that the Biden term is a a four-year affair? Uh, I get the strong sense that they've decided that they do not want to deal with Democrats anymore in the U.S. Mm -hmm. They like to deal with Republicans. They don't want to deal with the Democrats. That's fine, but it's very insulting and, uh, you know, offensive to Americans because Americans are our own choice who we elect and we expect other countries to deal with them, uh, you know, by, you know, to recognize the democratic choice of the American people, not to have preferences and prerogatives and trying to change the configuration of U.S. politics. I have a theory about this, that in D.C. there are a few countries which seem to get everything they want using different means, financial or other forms of soft power. 
Saudi Arabia is has been in that little bracket of countries. The UAE is there, Israel is there, Turkey is there to some extent, even Azerbaijan is there in many ways. Mm-hmm. And they have a sense of entitlement now because under Trump, you could really see these countries got everything they wanted. They got everything they wanted uh, and more with a bow on top. And they're getting a little bit less than that now, as you said, Crystal. And that's antagonizing them. And they want to go back to 100 percent because as they see it, they're paying for a service, which is the protection of this empire that is far away, but gives them what they want. And they have these relationships in D.C. with their elites and they want everything they want in return. They want good customer service. They want no one be criticized. They want to be praise and coddled. And if they don't get that, they're going to be very angry, just like someone will get angry with bad customer service for a service they're paying for. I think that this transactional relationship that we're seeing, it's something which if you pay more attention to, it's quite outrageous. It's the undemocratic. It does result in de facto interference in our politics. Uh, you can see this by maybe this MBS is thinking that if we don't help Biden with oil prices, the American people will kick him out in a couple of years because it'll be so dissatisfied, then we'll turn the taps back on for Republican administration. That's fine, but in the, those couple of years, Americans are gonna suffer a lot. And Americans mm-hmm. are not, you know, they're not they're gonna remember this as it happened as well, too. I think yeah. that yeah. if we pay a lot more attention, we'll see that Saudi Arabia is just one of many countries deeply interfering in politics. And it's even a bit worse because other countries maybe have some organic base of support in the US. I think we can all recognize that Saudi Arabia does not have a mass support base in the US. They, what yeah. they get is yeah. money, and it's about money. And it should not cross certain lines, uh, include up to and including trying to manipulate the outcome of our elections now and in the future. That's well said. I would submit that gas prices probably more consequential for U.S. elections than some Russian Facebook ads. Ah, in poorly oh. worded English, but you know that's There's just no my con- guess. No constituency on that for cable <laughs> news, unfortunately. Murtaza, thanks so much for joining us, man. Great to have Always you. enjoy your work. Everybody, go and check him out. Uh, we'll put a link down to his Twitter in the description. Appreciate you joining us. My pleasure, guys. That's how you. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Uh, like we said, and you know, we've been trying to emphasize, this is the most censorious environment we've ever operated in. I was watching with bated breath because we had to play a clip of Putin in our Thursday show. Right. And I, I, was, I was sure that it might get taken down or might get taken off. Same with demonetization on so many of these segments. Look, the news is not always good. Sometimes it's bad. And especially in this hot-blooded, crazy environment, we are just simply one step away from total you know, takedown. I see on Spotify, we have, when's the last time we even covered COVID? We did it today. I think, well, like two weeks, maybe three weeks. Yeah. All of our episodes are being labeled on COVID misinformation and all this. All of this is to say is that we rely on you guys, uh, <sighs> our premium program, to build the team. We have all that awesome third-party content, which has been performing really well. We have some more cool stuff in the pipeline. And in order to pay all those bills, we rely on you. So thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. Did you see the thing that happened with Kyle? He had covered the yeah. Full Send podcast yes. interview with Trump. Uh-huh. And he didn't even play the part of the interview where right. Trump ta- talked about Stop the Steal, Rigged Election, yes. or whatever. And they pulled the entire— oh. His coverage of an interview right. of the president yeah, of the yeah. United States. Like, that's the former that's president. Exactly. Insane. Oh, man. They, look, we can't <laughs> operate this way. So we rely we on rely you. We rely on you guys. That's that's what the way it's saying. Yep, that's why we built it. That's why I appreciate you all so much. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. See you tomorrow.
Hey guys, we're gonna be totally upfront with you. This is the most perilous time that we have ever operated in. It is so difficult just to try to sort through the news, but even more importantly, to bring you accurate information as this wave of lockdown and censorship spreads across the nation. Yeah, look, if you can become a premium subscriber today at breakingpoints.com, you're gonna help us build out a vibrant, independent media ecosystem, which is free of mainstream pressure. We can't tell you how important that is at a time like this. Yep, that's right. Go to breakingpoints.com to subscribe. We love you guys and we appreciate you so much.